Dadusunda, may God bless you. We love you. Welcome, please. Welcome. God bless. God bless. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Can you? Okay. No? Yes. If no, you should come nearer. Come closer. Well, today, our pastor had announced a few days ago that uh, it's going to be a question and answer session. And uh, many of you gave lots of questions last night. And uh, it was passed to me last night so that I can prepare myself and familiarize myself with the questions. Uh, it was not like in another church where it was an impromptu session. The questions were not uh, pre-told or pre-warned. <laughs> so we were right on the pulpit and it was a live program. Everybody was watching online worldwide and they just started shooting all the questions. <laughs> it was okay. It was okay. But many questions were totally unnecessary. Like for example, why you are wearing yellow? <laughs> Why you keep long hair? These are unnecessary questions which won't add value to our salvation or what we are here for. And last night when I look at many of the questions, good, but not edifying. They were more personal related rather than what God is speaking these past few days. So I thought it will be a waste of time to answer those questions. Doesn't mean to insult all of you who wrote those questions, but I felt today being the second last day of the conference and uh, we have two sessions. In view of what God has been speaking to us, I don't want to waste one entire session just answering all those questions when we have much more important matters at hand. I'm so glad you all agree with me. <laughs> Shall we all bow head out for a word of prayer? Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence this morning in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for gathering your dear children from far and near today. Lord, we have come this morning to present ourselves before you, to make ourselves known to you, to seek your holy face, Open our hearts, Lord. Open our ears, Lord, that we may hear what the Holy One of Israel will speak to us in these last days. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Sound men, today the sound is very good. At least they make me feel happy on my last day. <laughs> <coughs> Sound engineering is a great art, you know. So that young man over there gives us a great hand of applause. Sometimes it's never easy to get it right. Even though you may have the best sound engineers. the unimaginable can take place at the most important moment. It can take place. The videos can go punk. The sound can go punk. So we need the grace of God. Amen? Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Esther. Esther, the chapter 4. Last month, when I was in California, speaking for a Chinese church conference in the city of Costa Mesa. I had an encounter with the Lord one day. 
that uh, brought a deep conviction into me and also altered the way how I personally looked at things. On June the 17, 2015, around in the evening hours, there was a mass shooting that took place at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in downtown Charleston, South Carolina. Are you aware of that? I think this incident shook the whole of America very much. And during a prayer service, a gunman walked in and he pretended to be a seeker of the truth because according to the full report that I read this morning, it says that he entered into the service before the service began. He introduced himself to the pastor and he sat in the small prayer group, the prayer, prayer service, you know, where, where there were about uh, 10, 10, 12 people. And he sat directly beside the pastor. And after the worship was going on, went on, and when they started scripture study, it seems that he was very argumentative when they started discussing scripture. And then he stood up, took out a gun from his back, pointed straight at the pastor, boom, the pastor went down. And then he went on, or before the pastor went down, one of the church member, as soon as he pulled out the gun, tried to talk him down. And it seems that he wouldn't be talked down. So he tried to shield this guy from killing others. And that was the first shot that was fired at that guy who shielded him from firing others. So when this first guy went down, he started firing at everybody else, nine of them, except one. Should have been 11 because another bigger woman and a little girl pretended to be dead. So they survived because they knew how to act dead. Praise God for that. <laughs> then there was another woman, another larger woman. This gunman came towards her, pointing a gun straight at her. He said, I should shoot you, isn't it? She was scared to say, what, what should she say, yes or no? So he told her, I'm not going to shoot you. There must be someone alive to go and tell everybody else what happened here. So, and every day in the news, all the news networks in the US were reporting these day and night. So during my uh, lunch breaks, I will turn on the TV to see what's happening. One day, <clears throat> as I was watching the news, suddenly I remembered one thing, you know. Last year, the Lord gave me a word that such a thing was going to happen in the black community in the U.S. So I, tried, I remembered, my, what the Lord showed me is coming to pass, not only in Charleston, but also in Ferguson, where there was another killing, and there was a riots, and a lot of massacre taking place. So as I was pondering all this, the Lord Jesus Christ walked in. He walked in, and he came and sat beside me on the sofa, and he was also watching the news. And uh, he never said any word, just silent. And then I turned to the Lord and I said, Lord, this is the very thing that you spoke to me that that's going to come, blacks are going to get killed by the white people and as a result, a racial riot will break out in this country and will have a domino effect all over the nation. All that while the Lord was quiet, you know, but the moment I said that, he turned around and he said, Yes, I revealed that to you, but what did you do about it? 
you know when the lord asked that question it was like an arrow of deep conviction hit me and i became so scared that i had done something wrong and i immediately i fell down on my knees and i said lord what are you saying is there something wrong did i do the lord said the wrong that you did was not to do anything about it i still didn't understand you know what what the lord meant the lord said why do i revealed of things to come to pass why it is for my people to do something about it to do something about it you don't just take the information and you broadcast it and then period you know that day i learned something actually a prophet's job is to pronounce what he sees or what he hears but that day i learned it doesn't stop there he should do something more marshal gather and provoke the people to do something about what has been revealed if we do nothing then whatever has been said will all come to pass but we can do something about it two things can be done one if we humble ourselves fall on our faces fast and pray seek the face of god the thing that has been pronounced can be averted totally averted totally stopped totally prevented or if it cannot be averted it cannot be prevented it must come to pass then the effects and the damages can be minimized instead of let's say 10000 people are going to die by an earthquake and in a 7.5 magnitude earthquake when you all pray instead of a 7.5 it can be just 3.5 a small earthquake and is there of 10000 people dying maybe just 10 people may die so this is the power of prayer so you save an entire nation Amen. from destruction Amen. sometimes it can totally be averted like i've shared with you many examples this past few days how even the sentence of death was overruled overturned when there was an intercession made so when people prayed it was overruled overturned and you have a biblical example for that in isaiah chapter 33 where isaiah the prophet was sent to king hezekiah to tell him you're going to die because he was having some kind of a cancer so you're going to die so don't waste time going to get admitted in this hospital get chemotherapy treatment that treatment this treatment don't worry don't waste your money because you're going to die since you're going to die set your house in order make sure that there is a succession for your leadership make sure that all your you write all the will perfectly so that there's no squabbling fighting among your children after you're gone that's what it meant put your house in order so as soon as isaiah delivered that king hezekiah must be young man no immediately the bible says he turned his face to the wall and he cried terribly he cried terribly now if you look at what he prayed he did not say lord why me i'm so young i should not die i still have plenty more years instead of saying like that he reminded god of all his righteousness say lord in your name i have done this remember this remember that remember this remember that you know the scripture tells us now put me in remembrance right so he was putting the lord in remembrance and ezekiah being a true prophet of god after he delivered the message he just walked away he didn't bother to see whether the mail is opened i've always used to wonder you know you know when mailman comes to your house when they 
throw the mail into your house and then they do this wait for you excuse me I just delivered you a mail open and read it <laughs> do they do that no in India in the old you know now many things have advanced so much in India but 20 years ago when the mail ke mailman comes he'll come and stand near the entrance of the house and he'll throw the letters into the house and shut letters and then he will walk away so that is an announcement that there is a mail for you you know but the mailman will not stand there why aren't you reading the letter that I delivered to you does he do we does he do that no whether you open or you don't open he couldn't care less that's what you do anyway most of us what we get are junk mails right we don't even open them we just throw them into the waste paper basket so our properties are like should be like that whether you pay heat or you don't pay heat that's not his problem his problem is to deliver so that's what Isaiah did he delivered and he walked away but the Bible says from the entrance or from the presence of the throne of Ezekiah and before he reached that doorway the word of the Lord came unto him go back and tell Hezekiah I have seen your tears that's the first word God said you know God did not say tell him I heard your prayer he said I have seen your tears why did he God said that because tears is the result of a broken heart and a broken heart is the result of a humbling heart and humbling attitude so that's what is more important in intercession in getting the attention of God not mere two-minute prayer not simply gathering together and say let's pray for this and everybody shout for 10 minutes done how do you know it's done it hasn't even reached this ceiling about 10 years ago I spoke at a church in Taiwan so there were about 1,000 Chinese believers who gathered at the meeting it was during the Chinese New Year festival so the whole of China the whole of Taiwan they close all establishments for one week so the Christians usually have their conferences conventions during that time so there was this place that invited me and in one of the sessions the word of the Lord came unto me concerning something that was going to happen to Taiwan so I shared with them I said now let us all pray you know I've never seen a people group like the Chinese people who really know how to pray if you want to learn prayer you must all go to China or Taiwan see them in prayer you will learn a thing or two how they take hold of God so when the call was given all these 1,000 Chinese believers came right up to the altar some felt full prostration some just knelt down and they began to cry and they began to beat their chest beat their faces and they cried and they cried and they cried unto God for 45 minutes tears were rolling down their eyes mucus was rolling down their noses everything was taking place I'm not exaggerating I'm just telling you what I saw before my eyes you know because there was this one woman who was very close to me and she was crying and crying and crying every now and then she would lift up her face and look up to sky that's when I saw all the mucus coming down you know see they took hold of God with such a passion for 45 minutes the whole building reverberated with their cries and with their shouts and with their prayer 45 minutes non-stop I, I couldn't do anything to stop the meeting so I went and sat at a corner waited for everything to die down and just as it was just dying down an angel appeared before me with a bowl and he told me this prayer is not enough 
I said, what do you mean this prayer is not enough? They prayed for 45 minutes. Look at them. The mucus is still there on their face. And the angel told me, come, take a look. So he had a bowl in his hand, you know. He said, look down. When I looked down, you know, at the very, it was a big bowl, about 15 inches high. And there was a, just a small pool of tears at the very bottom of the bowl. So I asked him, what is this? These are all their tears. I said, that shouldn't be. For 45 minutes, 1,000 people have prayed. The bowl should be full. So he told me, that's how you see. But that's not how God sees. Whatever it is gathered here comes from them. You see, it's not enough for bodies to gather together to make numbers. Hearts must gather. You must offer your hearts as a broken sacrifice before God. That's what will matter. When you present your hearts as a broken sacrifice before God, even if you pray a one-sentence prayer, that will fill up the entire bowl. You know, about 15 years ago, I spoke at a church in Singapore for a Sunday service in an Anglican church. So after the meeting was over, uh, some people came for prayer. Among them was one, not middle-aged, in her mid-thirties, woman came up to me for prayer. So I asked her, what do you want? So she said, please pray for my stomach. Okay, stomach means, what is stomach? You got stomach cancer, stomach ulcer, stomach pain, stomach this, stomach that. So many problems are there, right? So when you say stomach blindly or in general, how am I going to know what, what to say? So sometimes I try to ask for specifics, but people don't be specific. They want to be general. Okay. So just as I was about to touch her, her friend who brought her to the front, nudged her, tell him the truth, tell him the truth. She said, no, no, no. I was wondering what was going on, you know. She said, tell him the truth, tell him the truth. Her friend is our ministry partner. So then finally she said, oh, you know, the following Tuesday, I'm going for surgery to have my womb removed. Because the doctors have diagnosed that I've got some kind of a corruption in my womb and we're going to be removed. So I asked her, what do you want me to pray? So she said, you know, I already have two boys, so I don't mind having my womb removed, but it'll be good not to have it removed. So I said, okay, so what do you want me to pray? So she said, please pray that the surgery will be successful. I said, are you sure? I thought you said you don't want your womb to be removed. She said, yeah, but pray that the operation will be successful. I said, okay. So I, I laid my hands on her. As soon as I did that, it was such an indescribable compassion came upon me. And I felt my heart break into a thousand pieces. And I prayed, Lord, renew and restore her organ. Amen. So I tapped her, I said, Sister, prayer is finished. What? Prayer finished? I said, yeah, prayer is finished. You can go. I mean, that's all? Just one center? Yeah, that's all. You mean you didn't need to jump up and down, shout and pray? I said, no, that's all. Pray done. So, as she was walking back, she was mumbling and grumbling. Later on, she confided to me, or she confessed to me, these Indian preachers do not know how to pray. <laughs> true. True. I did not know how to jump up and down like a kangaroo in the Pentecostal style, you know. <laughs> you know, in the olden days, they have these cars that you crank up. Have you seen those kind of cars? 
You have to crank them up, and then the car will start. So in some Pentecostal circles, that's what they do. They first they'll jump up and down in a frenzy, and praying in tongues for 10 minutes, and when they're all charged up, then they pray another prayer. That's not too bad. Okay, that's okay. If you want to live in the 50s with a cranked up car, that's fine. <laughs> so, that woman simply could not believe that I just prayed a one sentence prayer. She was thoroughly convinced that this, it was a bad mistake to go up to this Indian guy for prayer because he doesn't know how to pray. So, the following Tuesday was the day of her surgery. And when she was wheeled into the operating data, from her room to the operating data, this was her confession from her own mouth. She was full of fear. Because in a little while, she's going to lose her organ. She was full of fear. And when they wheeled her into the operating table, she saw all those lights. It's a scary thing, you know. Have you seen an operating theater? Those lights scare you more than the surgeon's scalpel. So, and she looked at great fear, fill her heart. At that moment, she felt that I was standing beside her and prayed in her ears. She literally and audibly heard, Lord, renew and restore her organ. She heard it so real, so audible, as if I was literally standing there. And just at that moment, the anesthesis gave her the injection, and she fainted, and the surgery was all over. Do you know, today, doctors give you a specimen, sample of what they take out from your body, right? For all the money that you paid them, they give you a sample. Okay, this is what we cut from your body. Take this souvenir home. So, when this woman opened her eyes, her surgeon was standing before her, and she asked the surgeon, So, how did the surgery go? The surgeon, who is not a believer, he told her, when we cut you up, we found your uterus or your womb renewed and restored. We need not remove that, so we just patch you back again. You see, she cried and she cried and she cried when she heard that from the surgeon's mouth. And the surgeon didn't know why she was crying until she told him what happened that Sunday in the church. And that unbelieving surgeon told her, truly, your God has done a miracle for you. Totally recreated, renewed and restored. Only God can do that. Amen? You see, that was just a one-sentence prayer that didn't take more than one minute. So it's not, sometimes quantity is also important. But what is a quantity if there's no quality? So the quality, the attitude of your heart matters very much. How you pray. The attitude of the heart matters. If your heart is not there, if you come to a prayer meeting, and all your mind is thinking about when the pastor will say the last Amen. And you can go back home to watch a ball game. If that's what your mind is thinking, then your soul is not there. Your heart is not there. Your body is there. Physical body is there. You know, I am a great uh, football fan. In America, I should say soccer fan. So... Our pastor is from Cameroon and our bishop is from Cameroon. So one day over dinner, we talked about football. So I said, oh, Cameroon has got a very good, great football team. So they said, not anymore. I said, not anymore? But two uh, World Cup football seasons ago, they were a great team. 
that made it all the way to the quarterfinals. No one expected an African team to make it all the way there. In fact, I was hoping and praying they will, they will win the World Cup. It will be a, a good turn of climate for once for an African nation to win the World Cup. That was because I was quite upset, you know. My favorite team, Brazil, was got kicked out. <laughs> so since Brazil is out, it doesn't matter to me who else wins the World Cup. <laughs> So, so and uh, uh, unfortunately, Cameroon did not pass quarterfinals to the semifinals. So we were talking about it, and then they told me that the standard of soccer in Cameroon went down. So why did it go down? That was a good question. So what Dr. Ellisworth told me a very interesting story. She said during the soccer season, soccer was like an idol in Cameroon. They will rather skip church to watch a ball game. So once your father, no, your father, her father, a mighty prophet of God in Cameroon was so upset, he said, I curse this idol of soccer in Cameroon and the team will decay. Ever since that word was spoken, Cameroon's standard went down. You see, it's a heart attitude. Where's your heart? When you gather together, the Lord Jesus said, no, two or three of you, if you gather together, I am there in your midst. Now there are hundreds of us in our midst. We are gathering together. Why, isn't, why aren't we seeing the Lord in our midst? Why? The scriptures cannot be wrong, right? The Lord said just two or three. There are more than three here. Maybe a hundred. Why don't we see the Lord Jesus? The problem is, hundred bodies are here. A hundred souls and minds and spirits here. That's the question. Hundred bodies are here. But not hundred minds not hundred souls, there's no one unity. So there's no oneness there. They're all divided, disjointed. That's why we can't see the Lord. You know, I demonstrated this reality of the scripture once in our family gathering. So, my mother and my siblings, we were all gathered for a, just a family worship. So we're singing songs and... Uh, before that, my mother expressed a desire to see the Lord Jesus in the meeting. She said, you always see the Lord Jesus. Please tell him that I also should see him. <laughs> so I told her, don't worry, it's not a big problem. It's one of the most easiest thing. It's the most easiest thing. So we started worshipping. And when we started worshipping, it was like a disjointed thing there. You know, it's not that each one of them was singing on a different scale. You know, one was A, one was B, another one was Z. You know, all the elf, 26 alphabets. I always sing in the Z key. That's my peculiar gifting. So, then I stopped everybody. I said, look, look, something is wrong here. So everybody looked at me. So I said, look, let's do one thing first. Let's calm down. Let's not have any hurry buddy in our spirit. We don't have to rush to in a prayer. Let's calm down. Bring the heart and the mind and the soul into oneness. Let's do that first. Then let's sing. When we do that, then the scripture says, where two or three are gathered. You know what is the meaning of that scripture? Two is your spirit and your soul. And the third person is the Holy Spirit. Your spirit and your soul becoming one with the Holy Spirit. When it becomes one with the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit will then remove the veil of the spiritual realm. Once the veil is removed, you will see the Lord Jesus right before you. 
So I shared them with this. I said, now let's do it again. After five minutes, just five minutes, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing beside my mother. And I didn't want to say that. I want her to see. After another two minutes, she started shouting, Oh, I see the Lord Jesus! <laughs> and I asked her where, and she pointed at the right place where I saw. And all it took was just a total of seven minutes. Not one hour of worship or two hours of worship. It's good. But the hearts must be united. The heart, the soul, and the mind and the body must all come together in one unity. If you read Second Chronicles chapter 5, there it is written, when all the worshippers, all the singers, and all the musicians were one. There were more than 100 singers, musicians, they were all were one, one, one heart. All the hundreds of musicians, their hearts were united, one. All the musicians, all their hearts were united in one. When they were one, the Bible says, and they made one noise, one. Not 120 voices, one voice. One voice sounded in God's ears. And when there was perfect unity, the Bible says the glory of God came down in such a thick cloud. Now this happened under the old covenant when the blood of Jesus was not shed yet. I often used to pray, you know, I asked the Lord, if you can bless the people under the old covenant with that glory, why can't you bless us, bless our churches in this new covenant when everybody is washed by the blood of Jesus, when everybody has the Holy Spirit? Why? So the Lord answered my question very simply. He said, the difference is they knew something which this present charismatic Christianity doesn't know. I said, what is it, Lord? I said, one simple difference. They worshipped God in the spirit of holiness, in the beauties of holiness, in spirit and in truth. This is where you guys are missing it. In your churches, you don't worship God in the beauties of holiness. And the Lord went on explaining to me, you know. So I eventually wrote a book called The Art of Worship based on what the Lord revealed to me. And then he said, look at all the songs that are sung in the church today. So I made a research. For one hour of worship, you may sing about 20 songs or maybe 30 songs. Out of the 20 songs, only 1% of the songs ascribe praise and glory to God. The 99% is all self. Self. All self. So that is not worshipping God in the beauties of holiness. 99% is self-centered singing. Make me feel good singing. Okay, let me give you an example, okay? I don't mean any offense to anybody. I praise God for all the anointed psalmists and worship leaders. Wonderful saints who have written many, many wonderful songs. But this is just an example. When the Spirit of the Lord is moving in us, I will sing like David sang. You know that song? You sing that song? Okay, let's use this as an example. When the Spirit of the Lord is moving in our midst, I will sing like David sang. You want to sing and dance like David danced, go back to the Old Testament. Why would you like to sing and dance like David when you are not singing and dancing like David? Right? You know, King David, 
he was exuberant in his worship. He was, he, you, you couldn't find him standing in one place. He'll be jumping all over in exuberant singing and dancing. If you want to sing and dance like David, you should do like that. You should be all over this church. Not locked onto one seat. You stand in one place and say, I will sing like David. <laughs> and you stand like a soldier and you said, I will dance like David dance. <laughs> you are mocking David, you know. Okay, besides that point, the point is, what praise, what magnificence or majesty or glory is in that song unto God? There's none. If you do a survey of all the songs that we sing, 99% of our worship songs fall into that category. So what glory is, are we giving to God? What praise are we giving to God? None. Except for that 1%. And when you get into that 1%, and just as the glory is about to break out, the pastor comes and takes the mic and says, Amen! kills everything <laughs> when are we going to repent you tell me now can you see how low we are how low we are how filthy we are how unprepared we really are what a horrible mess we all are in and yet the Lord loves his bride. Yet he loves. That doesn't change, you know. His love doesn't change. But he feels sad and sorry that we are in such a mess. When such a great danger is looming over our, this nation, what are we doing? Now again, I don't mean an insult to anyone. I say this with great love. Shall I speak the truth to you? Yes. I say this great love with a heart of sincerity. All the questions that were written, you know, this morning when I was praying and asking the Lord, shall I go and do this thing? He said, for all that you sh shared about what is going to come to pass in this nation, how many of them cared about what they should do for this nation? There was not a single question about what should we do now or what we should do next. All the questions were self-centered questions. About their personal thing. For personal survival rather than the salvation of the nation. So again, the word, the word of the Lord came in to remind me, this is what I meant when I said, I'm looking for one man and I found none. Looking for one man to stand in the gap. But I found none. Because I found none, my hand will bring judgment. When you don't care for your own nation, who will care for you? Tell me, who will care for you? It makes a difference, you know, for the sons of the soil to cry than for a stranger to cry. Right? I can pray for you, you know, but my burden will not be greater than your burden. Because to me, I'm just a visitor. When I pray, the burden that I have will come from the Lord. But when you pray, your burden comes from the soil of the ground. 
because you are part of this land. You are of this land. You are the sons and daughters of this land. You are living in this land. You make your home here. Your children are here. Your grandchildren are here. Your future is here. You must care. You must pray for your safety. When a great destruction comes, for example, Katrina that destroyed Louisiana. Now even the churches are destroyed, right? When the whole city was flooded, all the churches in the city were flooded. They were destroyed. Christian homes were destroyed. Even the righteous will suffer. So why don't we think like that? Don't think that we'll all be caught up. No, not yet. Not yet. Before the catching up, which will come, the church will have to go through the fire. A fire of purification. But while we're going through the fire of purification, when all these calamities are taking place, what are we going to do? Are you going to just do nothing about it? Let the hurricanes come and tear your homes apart to pieces? You want to let earthquakes come, rip the nation apart to pieces? You want to do nothing and let a foreign army come to invade the US? Do you know this coming? Last year, a ministry called True News interviewed me on the radio. So they called me and we, the, the pastor, Rick, was interviewing me. Before that, I prayed. I said, Lord, I do not know what question this man is going to ask me. It's a live program. You can't say, ah, 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 ah. You can't do all that, right? If it's a pre-recorded program, you can do all the ah, ah, ah. And we'll just cut and edit everything. Like we do in our TV studio. We cut and edit all the ah, ah, ah. Even when I, when I stumble and I make a mistake in words, my editors are so good. They'll just cut away everything. And they'll make me sound so flawless. So flawless as if I'm a grammarian. <laughs> but in a live program, a ha, 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 is all there. You can't escape. So I prayed. I said, Lord, I do not know what question he's going to ask me. I don't want to be put in a spot, not being able to answer. And the Lord told me, I will send my angel to you. And he will give you the answers to give him. I said, all right, Lord. I felt very confident now. Not to worry. I have supernatural help now. Amen. So while it was going on, he started asking very mundane questions. Where are you from? Where are you coming from? What do you like to eat? This, that, all these mundane questions, you know. And then we got into some serious topic. As we were getting into a serious topic about the U.S., this angel the Lord told me will come and help you. He just walked up towards me. He was standing there all the while. And he handed me a note. He said, tell this. So I looked at the note. I was shocked. Russia will attack the US. That was what was written in the note. He said, tell it to him. So I told him. An angel just walked up to me and gave me a note. And it says, Russia will attack the US. And he was silent for 30 seconds. Instead of me being ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, it was him now, silent. And I said, brother, are you still around? He said, what did you say? I said, an angel just walked up to me and handed me this note. He said, oh my God, this is the same word I got 20 years ago that Russia will invade the US. And not only this now, this man, Rick, is an American. But there's another man, a Romanian guy called Dumitri. Duman? Dunaman, okay. Dunaman Dumitri. Okay. Now he too received words like that. And there are many people. So what are we doing? You tell me now. David Wilkerson, okay. So there is an impending invasion coming. Please don't think that such things will never take place. 
once upon a time that's what you thought and look what happened on 9-11 who would have thought America would be attacked who would have thought no one would have imagined even in their dreams that mighty America will be attacked instead by a great army just four guys who took commercial flying lessons just four guys and they didn't even qualify completely to get their pilot's license they just learned enough how to get the plane up in the air maneuver fly it down land it that's all they learned they say enough they didn't complete their course because their intention is not to become a full pledge licensed pilot to work for United Airlines or whichever airlines their intention was to crush the plane into the White House into the Pentagon and into the Twin Towers and I am sure it was the prayers of the saints in America that prevented the plane from crushing into the Pentagon and into the White House that it landed somewhere else it happened on the Twin Towers that was a sample that God is showing you what can happen when a nation's spiritual guts are down or when God removes his hand from the nation what can happen it was a sample so what did we do after that did the nation turn back to God in righteousness and repentance no it lasted for just two or three months churches were all filled to the brim just for that small period after that everything was back to normal now today you have another fine two buildings on that very spot where the twin towers were so everything is forgotten everything is gone when your kids grow up they will never know that there were twin towers now they'll see new twin towers Do you really care for your nation? Even though you may be a migrant from Cameroon, now you are planted in this soil. If you are planted in this soil, this is your land. This is your country. You are not an immigrant. You are now a citizen. This is your land. This land is now feeding you. This country is watering you. This country has given you a roof. This country has given you shelter. So this is your country. So if this is your country, then you must love this country enough to give your life for this country. See, that's the question the Lord asked us yesterday. Who really loves this nation so much so that they will stand in the gap and take hold of God? How many are there? So, when the Lord came to me that day in Costa Mesa, and asked me a question so what did you do about it I was too scared to answer any further and I just sat at the feet of the Lord Jesus put my head on his knees in repentance and I said I'm so sorry Lord I didn't know that I should do something about it and then he spoke to me about Esther Esther chapter 4 verse 14 for if thou altogether, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. What I'm sharing with you this morning and will be part one and tonight will be part two of this subject for such a time as this. This is the title of my message for such a time as this. Then the Lord asked me a question. Are the people really prepared for destruction, persecution and tribulation? Are they prepared? 
or is it going to come upon them unawares? Are you going to be caught off guard? Are you prepared? Do you all believe in the rapture? You don't? Yes or no? Okay. Which one? That's the next question. Which one? Pre-tribulation -tri pre rapture? No. no. Mid-tribulation rapture? Possibly. Post-tribulation? Possibly. So pre-trib is out? Out? Out. Certainly out? Everybody agree? Oh, I'm so surprised. Okay, anyway, there are three schools of thought. Pre-tribulation rapture is before any tribulation takes place, the the true bride of Christ will be taken away. Then the mid-tribulation rapture says, in the middle of the tribulation, the bride of Christ will be removed. And the post-tribulation says, after the tribulation, just before the coming of the Lord Jesus, the bride will be caught up. These are three schools of interpretation. So mid-trip, pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip. So whichever you believe, whether it's pre-trip, mid-trip or post-trip, what matters most is you must be ready. See, nobody knows for sure because with so many interpretations that we have, nobody knows for sure which exactly, when is the timeline. My stand is this. I know which one to believe. That's my personal belief. But whatever it is, what good it is for us if we, you know all the theology about pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip. But if you're not ready, you can't make a trip. <laughs> so what's important is we must be ready. When we are ready, whether it's mid-trip, Pre-trip or post-trip will be caught away. Why fight over all these bones? They are contentions, you know. They are bones of contentions. Let's get to the main meaty part. The main meaty part is being ready. Like the bride who has adorned herself in a white gown. Instead of doing that, you are, you are fighting with all these churches and denominations. No, this is right. Oh, that's right. When with all this fighting, you forget to put on the gown. When you forget to put on the gown, your hair is undone. No mascara on your face, no lipstick, no nothing. Oh, you look like you just got up from your bed. <laughs> now you tell me which bridegroom will come for such a bride. You know, when you, on the day of your marriage, when you walk down the aisle, the bridegroom is already waiting, right? He's waiting, and he's facing the, the, the minister, waiting for the bride to walk down the aisle. And then when they play that uh, piano recital for the bride to come, and he turns around, and he looks at someone in her nighty, <laughs> barefoot, Hair all <laughs> microwaved, <laughs> and uh, that bride is dazed. The groom will be thinking, "What in the world happened to this woman? Right? Has she forgotten that today is her wedding day? How come she didn't get ready?" That will be the question, right? How come you didn't get ready? A wise and sensible bride will spend hours, if not days, in preparation for that one moment of her life. Just for a one hour service. That's all it will take for the ministers to say, I pronounce you as man and wife. For that one moment, she'll spend hours, if not days, in preparation. Queen Esther. She spent one year in preparation 
for that one moment of her lifetime. If instead of doing all that, we are just debating, look, what you believe is wrong. And then he says, no, what you believe is wrong. Check on, show me the Bible. So he quotes the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. He said, give me the Bible. Let me quote to you. That's what I once upon a time did about speaking in tongues. I was born again in a church that doesn't believe that. And they had a bunch of scriptures to prove speaking in tongues is of the devil. And I knew all the scriptures like a juggler, you know. And I debated with Pentecostal pastors. And I convinced many of them that speaking in tongues was wrong. And those pastors repented. <laughs> you see? The sword of the Lord is double-edged. It can swing either way. It can cut either side. No, that's not the issue. The issue is getting ready. When you are ready, you will hear the sound of trumpet. Only those who made themselves ready will hear the sound. In 1985, I came from India to do some ministry meetings in Singapore. I landed at the airport at about 9-ish in the night and took a cab to go to the pastor's house. You know, the Singapore airport is located on a reclaimed land on the easternmost part of the country. So as we were driving, I was just closing my eyes and praying. Suddenly, I heard the sound of a trumpet, very clear and audible in my ears. So I turned and looked around where this sound was coming from. You know, sometimes school kids in their band, they'll play instruments, right? So I looked around, and it was still jungle. It's sea on one side, and a golf course on the other side. No school children to be found. So I asked the driver, he said, excuse me, sir, where is this sound of the trumpet coming from? This man, an old man, he turned and looked at me. He had such a queer look. What sound? I said, sir, sound of this trumpet. And he just mumbled something in the Chinese language and kept on driving again. So I thought, okay, maybe he didn't understand the word trumpet, I thought, you know, with my Indian accent. So I kept quiet. After a few moments, again I heard the sound of the trumpet. It was real loud and audible. So I said, sir, this trumpet sound, where is it coming from? He turned and he looked at me. He said, what trumpet? Where did you come from? I say, India. No wonder. <laughs> no wonder you are hearing weird sounds. I felt so embarrassed by that. And I didn't want to ask him any more questions for the rest of our journey. I just kept quiet. After a few minutes, again I heard the sound of the trumpet. Very loud, clear sound. Pa -pa -pa, pa -pa -pa, pa -pa -pa. And I, I was so scared, I said, sir, sir, you know, better not ask him anything. <laughs> better not. So I just kept quiet. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit told me, listen carefully where this sound is coming from. So when I quieted myself, then I noticed this sound was coming from far away, out in the sky, not from the ground level. And the Holy Spirit told me, what you are hearing now is the sound of the trumpet that will be blown on that day. There are two of you in this taxi, only you are hearing it, not him. On that day, only they who have made themselves ready will hear that sound. Wow. Not everyone, not everyone. Only they who have made themselves ready, only they will hear that sound. So that's why I always say, now why fight over bones that are unprofitable? Let's go to the meat of the issue. This was the problem the Lord Jesus Christ encountered with the Pharisees and Sadducees. He told them, you tight cumin, you tight anise, 
you take this, you take that, but you forget the weightier matters of the law. You have forgotten mercy, you have forgotten justice, you have forgotten righteousness. These are more important than mere tithing of cumin seeds and anise seeds and cinnamon. Don't be legalistic. Amen. Come to the spirit of the matter. Amen. The problem that was then is the same problem today. The spirit of Pharisees has not died. It is surviving, continuing in our churches till today. So when Esther was shown, a great disaster, danger was coming to her people. So Mordecai came and warned her, Esther, you must do something. And the Bible says Esther hesitated. She hesitated. And that's when he told her, look, you are a Jewish woman. Don't think, if you do nothing now, that just because you are the queen, you will escape. Don't think you will escape. You and your father's house will all die. Because they will find out that you are also a Jew. And if you do nothing, you will all perish. Even you will perish inside this fine, beautiful palace. Who knows? For such a time as this, you have been made a queen. You are not chosen to be a queen because you are the most beautiful woman. In fact, there were other beautiful girls than you. You were chosen because God chose you. God put that favor upon King Ahasuerus' heart for you, so that when he looks at you, he will want to marry you. Not because you are gorgeous, not because you are this, you are that, because God chose you to be positioned in that place, so that you can save your people. That's your call. Your call is not to be the queen. Your call is to be a savior. So, Mordecai came and told her that, that's your call. He told her about the danger. If you read in Esther chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. And she hesitated. Didn't know whether to believe it or not to believe. This was the same problem with Lot. If you read Genesis chapter 19, verses 15 to 16. When the angels came and told him, the city is going to be destroyed, you and your household get out. And the Bible says, Lot hesitated. Sodom and Gomorrah were twin great cities at that time. Great cities. They were in the valley, Jordan Valley, lush greeneries, fertile land, water flowing everywhere. How can this city be destroyed? How can fire come down from heaven? He couldn't imagine it. So how is it possible? So he was hesitating. Is it true? Is this prophecy true? Will it really come to pass? When you, when you spend all your time hesitating, that eventuality will come. And then you'll be gone. The Lord warns his people about coming dangers through persecution, tribulation or destruction. Before he, it comes, he first warns his people. It is going to come. Why does he want us? So that we can do something about it. Amen. Amen. So that we can do something about it. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 13, it says that God warned Noah of a coming worldwide destruction. He warned him ahead. Why did he warn him? So that Noah can make an ark, make a way of escape. Genesis chapter 6, verse 14 to 18. 
You know, the Lord told me one something very interesting about the ark. He said, if I cared for the animals to be saved, won't I spare the people who repent? I was so taken aback by that statement, you know, and it kept on ringing in my ears. If I cared so much to save those animals who can't speak, who are not made in the image of God, won't I care for the people whom I made in my image, who will humble themselves and repent? Second Peter. Chapter 3 verse 9 says, God is not willing that any perish. Any means all. God's not willing that any perish. But all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. All means all. You don't need to look up a dictionary to, to find the meaning of the word all, you know. All means all. All means the good the bad and the ugly, right? There is room in the ark for everybody, everybody. Amen. There were clean animals and there were unclean animals in the ark. The ark did not only contain clean animals, it also included unclean animals. See, the good, the bad and the ugly. All have an equal opportunity to be saved. Equal opportunity for everyone. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ is for everyone irrespective of our caste, creed, language, religion. It's for everybody. All you need to do is call upon the name of the Lord. That's all it takes. Especially in these last days. God is pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh. Amen. All flesh includes the Hindu people, the Muslim people, the Buddhist people, the communist people, any kind. All flesh. All laws that were prevalent in the Old Testament have been thrown into the wind now. There were criteria no, in the Old Covenant that only the kings, the prophets and the priests can be anointed with the Spirit. Not so in the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, it is all flesh. All the believers. Actually, in the church age, it was limited to all believers. But in the last days, the scripture says all flesh. Which means, even if an unbeliever walks into your church meeting, or into a crusade ground and he stands at one far end and he's hearing the word in that one moment if he says Jesus that's all is enough for the Lord to pour out his spirit upon that Muslim person or a Buddhist person two years ago a minister of God in my hometown conducted a evangelistic meeting in an open ground and uh, it was a three days of meeting. This is a young youthful minister. And there was a lot of singing, dancing, lights and smoke and every, all the stuff. And several thousands of people were gathered in the meeting. And uh, the noise was so loud that people all around the vicinity can hear this loud singing. Just beside the grounds, there is a girls dormitory or hostel. Where many students, university students were staying there one day. I do not know whether it's the second last day or the last day. Two girls, a Hindu girl from a very high caste Hindu family and a Muslim girl decided to go for a walk after dinner. As they were walking, they saw the whole sky was lighted up and they heard lots of sound and loud noises coming. So they thought, let's see what's happening. So they walked all around the field and came and stood at the far end of that crusade grounds. They were just standing in the corner and watching all this singing, dancing, going on. So they were, you know, these are just young kids and they just decided to spend 
uh, night. So we're just standing there and after all this singing and dancing, and they were hearing some testimonies, and then after that, the pastor gave a message, and after the message, he started praying for the people. And now these two girls were just still standing far at the end. They never dated an eye. They just never, they were just watching the whole thing, passing time. And during the hour of prayer, the minister of God saw the Lord Jesus Christ in his midst. And then he said, I see the Lord Jesus Christ standing here. The Hindu girl who was just watching it, suddenly she claimed, I see Jesus standing there. Her spiritual eyes were open. With her naked eyes, she saw both the Muslim girl and the Hindu girl saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing on the stage. They were awed. Jesus! And when the minister of God prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, those two girls were filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. Hindu girls, Muslim girls, just standing for at the far end of the stadium, at the crusade ground. And they then walk up to the stage and shed their testimony before everybody what God did for them. Everybody was in rapturous joy at what God did. That proof, that scripture, Joel 2.28, in these last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't have to be in a church setting. Don't have to follow the formula of first you come to the altar, pray the sinner's prayer, get baptized in the water, only then the Holy Spirit will come upon you. All that formula, as good as it is, sometimes you cannot play by the book. Right? God looks at the heart, you know. He looks at the heart. As soon as the heart is hungry, thirsty and ready, he just pours the spirit. In 1984, a pastor invited me to conduct a Holy Ghost meeting in his church. You know, in India, most of the Pentecostal churches, they have a Saturday night Holy Ghost meeting. But they don't call it the Holy Ghost meeting, they call it the tearing meeting. Means you wait. They take the word from the Bible, no? Tarry ye in Jerusalem. They are very biblical. So, and uh, so that is to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the pastor asked me to conduct it. So I said, fine, sir. And uh, one morning, I was having my cup of tea, and two little girls, 10-year-old and an 8-year-old sisters, they came running up to me. They said, uncle, uncle, please pray for us to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I look at them, they were Hindu girls who come, who are from the neighborhood, who come to the Sunday school. So I asked them, what do you know about the Holy Spirit? Nothing. <laughs> then why you want the Holy Spirit? Just keep him. <laughs> who told you about this? The pastor said. So I told them, don't worry, you don't need the Holy Spirit. What you need is for some wisdom for you. So let me pray for your studies. So I, I called those two girls. As I was about to touch and pray for them, I heard the voice of the Lord said, ask them to come tonight to the meeting. I will fill them with my spirit. Wow. So I told the Lord, Lord, these are Hindu girls. <laughs> See, I'm being like a Pharisee. Right? See, I'm being like a Pharisee with all those rules. Say, no, no, you have to follow the formula. So, <laughs> yeah, legalistic, that's right. So the Lord told me, no, ask them to come tonight. I will fill them with my spirit. I said, all right, he's my boss. So I, I told the girls, okay, you come tonight, I'll pray for you to get the Holy Spirit. Say, uncle, it's impossible. You know, in India, now, modern, now are modern times, now we are going back 30 years. In those early years, Girls are not allowed to leave the homes after sunset. They're supposed to be good girls in the house. So the parents will not allow them to leave the homes, you know. So, and these are little ones. So they said, Uncle, our parents will not allow us to leave the house. So I told them, what can I do? If you want the Holy Spirit, you must come tonight. And he said, no, Uncle, we cannot come. Please pray for us. 
I said, I can't pray for you. I was still not convinced that these girls will receive the Holy Spirit because they are not safe. They have not taken water baptism. Go to the X238 formula, you know. <laughs> so, and I said, they, they pleaded me, so, please, uncle, please, please, please. I said, no, 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 no. You come tonight. If you come tonight, I'll pray for you. Okay, they left. I was so convinced they will never show up because it is impossible for these kids to come out of their homes after sunset. So, at 7 o'clock in the evening, I walk into the church and right in the first row were these two girls. <laughs> and they were smiling from year to year when they looked at me. I was so shocked. So I motioned the older and said, come here. She came. How did you come here? She said, hey, uncle, when we got home, me and my sister, we prayed. They said, Lord, please send our parents out in the evening so that we can attend the meeting. We prayed so ardently. At 6.30 in the evening, the father and the mother told the girls, we are going shopping, you stay home. So, we came because our parents are out. Oh, I said, okay, what a point. <laughs> so, I, after the worship was on, I preached a simple message about how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then I asked all those who want to receive the Holy Spirit, please stand up. And these two girls just jump up like a spring, you know, jet from the box. I still had my doubts. No, these two girls, they had yellow powder smeared all over their faces and lines, uh, jasmine flowers all over their heads. And big smile, gleaning from year to year on their faces. <laughs> so they stood up. So I said, I, I said, all right, let's all pray now. So I started praying. And I said, in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Spirit. And these two girls, boom, they fell down to the ground. They were the first one to drop to the ground in one instant. As soon as they hit the ground, they were speaking in unknown tongues. Both the girls. They spoke in unknown tongues and they were singing in unknown tongues so beautifully in different multiple languages. I was so shocked. I was just looking. So my God. God did something that this Pharisee couldn't do. So after about uh, 30 or 40 minutes when everybody got up one by one, it's time for testimonies. Okay, come to the front and tell us what did you experience. And who was the first one? <laughs> Those two girls. The older one came first. She said, you know, both those girls shared a marvelous testimony. They said, when uncle laid his hand, I actually, I barely touched them. And they just fell down to the ground. They said, when we fall down to the ground, I was in a village and I saw some shepherds, they were all running and I felt in my heart I should run after the shepherds and I didn't know where they were running and they all entered into a small little shed where there was a baby and they were all standing and looking at the baby and I didn't know why they were all looking at the baby. You know what, they, what she saw? This girl was taken in the spirit 2,000 years be, behind time to witness the birth of the baby Jesus in Bethlehem. Now, let me tell you, I cross-examined the girl. She has never read the Bible. She does not know the intrinsic happening of what is written in Matthew chapter 2. She doesn't know at all. She only have heard stories, Jesus was born in a manger. And wise men from the east came. She, that's all she heard. But she had never heard about shepherds in the field. And the angels appeared to the shepherds and the shepherds ran to the manger. She has never read all that. But she saw the entire scene 
first hand. That was the testimony of the older girl. Now came the younger one, greening from year to year. She said, uncle, uncle, this is what I saw. I said, what did you saw? She was caught up to heaven and taken right up to the lap of the Lord Jesus. The Lord lifted her up, make her sit on her lap, his lap, and the Lord spoke tenderly to her. And the Lord told her, you must study well, be obedient to your parents, and be a good girl. That was the experience she had. You see, all the rules bypassed because of the hunger in those two little girls' heart. Hunger. Hunger to know God. That's why today, in these last days, all flesh shall be filled with His grace. Nobody believed Noah even though when he preached for 100 years. 2 Peter 2, 5 tells us that. And Noah preached, asked the people to turn back from their wicked ways. Now God warned Abraham about judgment to come upon Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 17, 21. When Abraham was warned, what did he do? He responded. He prayed. When a revelation was given to him concerning a destruction that was going to come, he did not just keep quiet about it. He acted on it. He did something about it. After hearing the warning of a prophecy or a, a prophecy of warning of danger, Abraham did not just walk away. But the Bible says, now please look at the Bible. In Genesis chapter 18 verse 22, it says, he pondered and considered. I, need, I want you to look at that phrase there. He pondered and he considered. What does that mean? When I look at the several other translations of the Bible, it says like this. Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham stood, st stood still before the Lord. The Lord remained with Abraham a while. Why? Because the message Bible translates it like this. Abraham stood in God's path blocking his way. God wanted to walk away, you know. Abraham stood there and said, No, Lord. No. Don't go yet. He blocked God and he started praying. What if there are 50 righteous people? What if there are 45 righteous people? He interceded. He did not, Oh, is it so, Lord? You're going to tear apart America. Oh, okay. All right, fine. That's good, Lord. He didn't do that. He stood and blocked God. That was so powerful when I was so stunned when I looked at the translation. He stood and blocked God from walking away and he interceded. He interceded. He said, no Lord, you cannot do that. You should not do that. Although Abraham knew so well that Sodom and Gomorrah are wicked people. They are terribly wicked. He knows them that too well. Sexual sins was just one of the problem. They were very, very prideful. They were very arrogant. If you read Ezekiel chapter 16, it gives you further details about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they, had, and they were great food wasters. Because there was so much of food, they waste the food. They don't eat what they wanted. They waste all kinds of food. They're not like good Americans, you know. When you don't finish your food, you bring it home in a doggy bag. They're not like that. They'll just leave the food and they'll walk away. Because they have too much of food. So Abraham stood in the way. So, what does it really mean? It is not God's will that any should perish 
but all must come to repentance. You know, please do not forget this scripture, Ezekiel 22, 30 and 31. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord. Now, the second part came to pass because of the first part. If verse 30, someone had done something about verse 30, there wouldn't be a verse 31. But because nobody did something, then God says, therefore, my hand will bring destruction. You know, Psalms 106, verse 23 tells us that like Abraham, Moses too stood in the way to prevent God from destroying the Israelites. And the verse says, therefore he said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the bridge to turn away his wrath lest he destroy them. Like Abraham, Moses too stood before the Lord. Say, Lord, no, you cannot, Lord. You cannot. You should not. How can you do this? The whole world looks up to America as a beacon of light, a beacon of freedom. How can you destroy? You know, let me give you a counsel. How you should pray. Go and dig up what are the words your forefathers have prophesied about this nation. Dig up what your forefathers have done. Like your first president, George Washington, what did he do? I know for sure, because I've seen this in a vision, he knelt down with one knee and he cried sincerely, dedicating America unto God. He did that. And all his tears fell down on the sand. And the Lord showed me, he said, I've collected that sand and kept before my throne. And I'm always looking at the sand. And the tears of George Washington praise to God. Lord, spare this nation. Spare this nation. Because of that, you are spared till today. So when I pray for U.S., I will remind God, I say, Lord, do you remember George Washington's prayer? This is how I pray for you. I'm just sharing with you how I pray for you. And all the other godly presidents that were in the U.S., they are four. What did they do? Dig up. And what are the words that God has spoken about America through godly prophets? And I will remind God, Lord, remember, they send missionaries all over the world. They send money to the poor nations. They help the poor people. They help India. They help Africa. They help the Asian nations to come up in life. They did all this, Lord. She put in remembrance before God all the good deeds that are in the land. Say, Lord, there are so many wonderful Christians in this country, so many wonderful churches, God-fearing people, Lord. How can you destroy this country? Please turn your anger. Please turn your breath. This is how I keep on praying. You should pray like that. When I pray like this, the Lord comes and tells me differently. He said, don't you know that these people are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah? That's what he told me, no? Don't you know they are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah? They are very, very stiff-necked and obstinate people. This is God's opinion about you.
So I broke down and I cried before the Lord. I said, Lord, even though they may be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, even though they may be obstinate, even though they may be stiff-necked, but remember, Lord, they are better than the Jews. The Jews are worse stiff-necked, worse obstinate. Even you wanted to destroy them, but you showed mercy to them. If you can show mercy to them, what about these people who are not that bad? See, this is how you should stand in the gap and pray and plead with God. Plead with God and cry unto Him. When you plead and you cry unto Him, He will look at your tears. Not only your mouth is praying, your heart is also praying, and your tears that rolls down your eyes, they are also speaking and crying to God. They have a voice, you know, and they will speak. So there are three of you who are praying unto God. So how can God say no to you when you pray with a broken heart? What, why most of our prayers are wrong is because most of the time we pray from a standpoint of being righteous people. Say, Lord, America's bad. Yes, Lord, they are filthy gays there. Yes, Lord, this. Yes, that, Lord. When you pray like that, you know what you make yourself to be? Like a hypocrite Pharisee. You know, the Lord said, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, one was a tax collector. And the Pharisee said, Lord, I am not like this man. I pray three times a day. I fast twice a week. But this guy is eating all the time. He went on praying like that. His prayer was not a prayer, no. He was making a comparison and he was making a judgment. I'm not like him. I'm not like him. I'm not like him. Then the Lord said, look at the Republic, uh, not Republican. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> not a bad party. Look at the publican. He, the Bible says, dare not even lift up his face and look to God. And he just said, Lord, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. He did not lift up his face. And the Lord said, this man, I heard his prayer. And he goes home justified because of his humility. If you study the prayer patterns of biblical saints, Abraham, Moses, Daniel, if you look at their prayer patterns, especially you look at the prayer pattern of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9. You know how Daniel prayed for his country? Lord, we have sinned. Lord, we have turned our back upon you. Now Daniel is a righteous prophet. He should not say, we. He should say, Lord, your people. Right? But that's not what he did. He st stood in the gap. Israel, God. He knelt down. He lifted up his hand and said, Lord, we have sinned, Lord. We are the one. Confusion belongs to us. We have turned our back against you. That is true prayer of intercession. When the church learns to pray like that, then that will move the heart of God. To move the heart of God because such a prayer is a prayer of humility. Such is a prayer that will totally break you down before the presence of God. Such is a prayer that will catch the attention of the heart of God because he sees his people humbling themselves, very remorseful, totally repentant, and they're truly sorry for the sins, not only in the land, but in their midst. That will move the heart of God. This is the kind of people God is looking for in the US. These are the kind of people. This is the kind of one man that God is looking for. Not self-righteous prayer. You know, the gays 
today have won the battle is because of you. You are partly to be blamed. If you, if the Christians were not committing adultery, if the Christians were not fornicating, if the ministers are not divorcing their wives and marrying their secretaries, if the church was pure and holy, you would have set a standard for the world to follow. Yes. You would be a loud voice of purity and holiness for the rest of America to follow. But because there was filth and fornication right in the church, in the pulpit, when you have gay bishops, gay ministers, gay pastors, gay deacons, gay believers. What standard are you setting for the world? So your judges of the land look at the church and said, Oh, the church condones it. So let's pass the law. The church did not stand up to say, No, sir, this cannot be done. Because we are a Christian nation. We are a nation under God. We cannot allow this filthiness to come into our nation. The church didn't say all that. The church was dumb, deaf, blind, stupid. You keep your mouth shut. Like what God said. It's written in the book of Ezekiel. The Lord said, my shepherds, they are blind and they are dumb. Dogs. Dogs are like that, you know. They don't buck. They just sleep the whole day. And God compares his shepherds to those dumb dogs. Because they will not open their mouth. They keep quiet. They did not cry against sin. They just kept quiet. Because you all want to be politically correct. You are afraid to make a statement for fear that you will be thrown into the prison. Let me remind you what the Lord told me. He said, if the first century apostles had feared for their lives, the world would not have heard the gospel. They did not fear for their lives. A few days ago, I shared with you about Thomas. He came to India. He was killed in India. In spite of all the persecution, he kept on preaching the gospel from state to state in India. With great signs and wonders and miracles. Thousands of Orthodox Hindus were turning to Christ. And the clergy, the Hindu clergy, and the high caste Orthodox Hindus were so mad that a large percentage of their people are turning to Christians. So they plotted to kill Thomas. They arranged many persecutions, but he was undaunted. He could have packed his back and went back to Jerusalem. <coughs> Take the next flight out. Oh, there's danger here, danger there. Let's fly out. He could have done that. No. You know, Thomas bought a one-way ticket. It's a do or die mission. Either you succeed or you fail. And I'm not going back. I'm not going back. This is where God sent me. God said, go. He did not say after some time, return back. He said, go. It's go. Means one way, right? It's not go and return. So don't buy a round trip ticket. But today, modern missionaries, at the sound, at the drop of a feather of a warning of danger, you're the first one to board a first flight and go out. If the first century apostles had feared for their lives, you and I wouldn't be sitting here today. We, we would have never heard the gospel. India would still be a Hindu nation. There are more than 30% of Christians in India today because of Thomas. Because of Thomas, his blood was shed in my city and among the whole of India my city has the largest number of 
ministries, churches and Christians and ministers because of where the blood was shed in the very same city. That blood, God has to answer that blood, you know, who was so selfless. That's what it is, selfless. Never thought about himself. He came because my master died. Let me also lay down my life like my master. Can God find such people today? Yes, Lord, here I am. I will answer your call for this nation. I am here, Lord. I am willing. No, 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 I'm just saying. <laughs> if he stands here and asks, who will go on my behalf? How many will answer? How many? Say, oh no, Lord, I'm not born here. I'm just an immigrant. Let me take the next flight out to safety. Remember what Mordecai told Esther. Don't think you will escape. You and your father's house will perish. You too will perish. Because, see, when you are in this soil, you lived here, you worked here, you earned here, you ate here, you breathe the air here, you are part of this land. If you run away, the judgments will follow you. It will follow you wherever you go. It can be Cameroon, it can be India, it can be Pakistan, it can be Japan, Korea, anywhere. The judgments will follow you. And it will meet you in one way or another. Just like Lot's wife. She ran out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the judgments followed her because her heart was in Sodom and Gomorrah. She was not like her husband, you know, a righteous man. She was living a compromising life, enjoying all the glamour, the fun, the lights, the glory, and the money they were making in Sodom and Gomorrah. All the jewelries, all the hundreds of pairs of shoes, all the clothes, everything. Her heart was there. So because her heart was there, the judgment followed her. And the judgment was just waiting for her to turn and look. Just that one moment, one simple moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when she turned and she looked, she became, she received the judgment that came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So don't think, you and your father's house shall be spared. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, God is not willing. It is not his desire. It pains him to pass judgments. But even then, it is love. Because the Bible says, God chastises those whom he loves. The chastisement is part of love. So that you don't lose your soul. You know, the shepherds in the field, what they do to an erring sheep, when a sheep doesn't obey the shepherd, initially the shepherd will try to talk to the sheep. Say, come on, you must be good, Mary. You must be, Mary must be this, Mary must be that. And when Mary doesn't respond, and if she's still stubborn, and she still wants to run all over the hills, then you know what the shepherd does? He breaks her leg. Oh yeah. He breaks her leg. He breaks the leg and then the poor Mary will be crying and crying and crying and he will tenderly carry Mary to his bosom and bandage her wound. He bandages her wound and all throughout the healing process the shepherd carries the sheep on his shoulder. Never lets her down until the bones are healed. He carries her. So after the bones are healed, and when he lets Mary down, Mary is ever obedient after that. She has learned her lesson. So that wounding 
as painful as it was, was for good. Was for good. And the shepherd did that out of love. B because if he doesn't do that, the sheep may run and fall down a cliff. Which is worse. It will lose his entire life. In this way, he saved his life. So in the same way, God has to do all this to save our soul. You know, many years ago, I was invited to pray for a young man, 24-year-old young man, who was diagnosed with terminal AIDS. 24-year-old boy. And when I went to the hospital, and I looked at this young man, so handsome, so young, so youthful, and he didn't know that he had terminal AIDS. The doctors have given him a few days to leave. So, and uh, the, the pastor who brought me told me, please, when you pray, don't make mention that he has this sickness because he doesn't know. I said, okay, that's fine. So when I look at the boy, so young, full of life, only 24 years old, can live for another 45 years, why should he die? So I felt so sad for him. So I started praying. I said, Lord, why should this boy die like this? When I prayed like that, the Lord showed me his life. He said, let me show you about his life. What did he do? Why this sickness came upon him? So the Lord told me, he will not rise up from this sick bed. But I want you to pray that his soul will be forgiven so that his soul shall be safe. You pray for that. Say, I said, all right, Lord, I prayed. I didn't want to pray in the English language because they will know what I'm praying. So I prayed in my own mother tongue so that nobody will know what I'm praying. So I prayed for what may seem like 20 minutes. Then I felt a release. And I knew that God had heard my prayer and answered him. The Lord told me, now his sins are forgiven him. So I got up, and then I just prayed a superficial prayer. Lord bless him, this, that, that, that. I know that part, that prayer God is not going to hear. The first part was heard. This is just superficial. And then I left. When I left, I told the pastor, this boy will die. He will not leave. In one week, he will die. And sure enough, he died in a week. But his soul is safe now in heaven. Sometimes you know, you can ask me a question now, but why couldn't God have forgiven him and let him live? Probably he would have become a great minister of God. That's what you think. What if he goes back to his old ways? Right? And the end will be worse than the former. See, God sees the end from the beginning. So he knows what can happen. If left unchecked, it will be worse. So better to save him now on this bit of affliction than lose his entire soul. So, in the same manner, whatever is going to transpire here, it requires prayer. Amen? So I ask that you take this seriously. And you need to do something about it. You must do something about it. You cannot remain passive or inactive. In your homes, in your small church prayer gatherings, small group prayer gatherings, whatever it is. Pray sincerely crying out to God with a broken heart. And that will move the heart of God. In conclusion, let's read one scripture. Please turn with me to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 3. Verse 9. Now, the background of the story is this. Jonah prophesies that 
Nineveh is going to be destroyed in 40 days. So when the king heard it, he proclaimed a national fast. So they all fasted from the king all the way down to the newborn babies. Everybody were fasting. Now look at verse 9. The statement made by the king. Or rather look at verse 8. But let men and beasts be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. So who knows? Who knows? When God sees all of you humbling, crying out to God, even your little sucking babies, all are crying out to God. You know, we should teach our little children how to fast and pray. You should not think, no, they are little children, they need food, they need milk. No, we should teach them how to fast and pray. In India, we have a monthly fasting prayer that we do in our city. And uh, while the adults are having their prayer meetings going on, we gather about 300 children for a separate meeting and we have separate services for them. And I told my staff, don't give any snacks, don't give any drinks to the children. Let's teach them how to fast. They are all 12 years old and below. Three, I think from 3 to 12. So initially, my staff opposed me. They said, no uncle, we cannot do that. These are little children, they will cry of hunger. Then they will create a mess. I said, don't worry, if they create a mess, just call me, I will come. The very first day, when we did the, we implemented this. So before the services started, the children's uh, services minister told all the kids, we are going to fast and pray. Not a single one of 300 kids cried for hunger. You know, we gather from at 10 in the, night, uh, 10 in the morning up to 3 in the afternoon. That's five hours, not a single solid food that even the little kids ate. They all fasted, they all prayed. Whatever points that we pray for in the adult services, we translate all the prayer points in simple forms for the children and the ministers lead them, break them up into groups and we pray for India, pray for Israel, pray for the Middle East, pray for the ISIS crisis, Pray for everything and those kids, you know, little ones, they lift up their hands, they cry unto God, they pray and then they hear from God and God tells them, pray for this. And these kids come up to the stage and tell us, I just heard God say, pray for this. <coughs> and they see visions when they are praying, little ones. We should teach in our church, our little ones. You know, the next revival is going to come upon them. So we should prepare that generation to be mighty prophets, mighty warriors for God. That generation should be made ready. Don't think they know nothing. This is the iPad generation, you know. You know, let me tell you. I have a very good friend, minister friend in Australia. A few years ago, I visited him and I married his daughter. And now she has got two girls, one we were having lunch and this girl told me, uncle you know about my daughter, her daughter is three years old. She said the daughter gets up in the morning, before she washes her face, her mother brushes her teeth or she drinks any milk, she goes to her mother's iPad, she pulls out the iPad, types the password and goes to YouTube. She goes to YouTube and she looks at some nice videos, she downloads the video and emails it to her mother's account. All this done by a three-year-old girl. I thought, ah, till today, I don't even know how to download a YouTube video. <laughs> I have to depend on my staff. I said, can you please download these videos for me? 
Prabhupada is a small little three year old doing all this. You know, that made me think, you know, if a three year old can have that much of common sense or wisdom, then they are capable of being taught much greater things than coloring. Right? See, we should change our Sunday school curriculum. We should change it. They are not dumb and stupid, you know. Say, color, color this. Color this, sit down, color. Watch video. Recently, someone sent me a mail, a children's minister, asking me for recommendation, what are some good videos for kids to watch during Sunday school? I say, what nonsense is this? They should be trained to be warriors. They should be taught the full armor of God. They should be taught to prophesy. They should be taught to see visions. Not play video games. Not do coloring. You see how stone age we still are? Where else our little kids are, are today the iPad generation. They know what's an iPad. They know what's an iPhone, smartphone. They know all that. And the church, see the world knows that very well. So the world has come up with so many apps and programs to entice our children. And what is the church doing? Sit down, stand up, do action songs, and do coloring. You tell a story. Once upon a time, there was a frog, <laughs> which was a prince. And then came Snow White with six dwarfs. One was still sleeping. <laughs> See, we are still in the Stone Age. We should change our Sunday school curriculum to the prophetic age. Amen. Amen. To the last day's curriculum. What is God's plan? You know, this was how I was corrected by God. Two years ago, we had a, a special one-day program for the children. On November 14, is one of our first Prime Minister's birthday. So that day is celebrated as Children's Day in India. So we decided to have a full-day event for the children. So I had all my uh, children's ministers plan a full day program from 10 in the morning up to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we had about 400 kids who came to that event and they were singing, dancing, puppet show, this show, that show, all the shows. And uh, I was going to give a message at the end of the last session. So at about noon, I came to the hall and I went right to the back of the auditorium to see the whole activity, festivity, and also to gauge the reaction of the children. So everything was going on great. The children were enjoying everything. And just half an hour before, it was my turn to go up to the stage. And so just sitting there and watching, I suddenly saw an angel come and stand beside me. I said, okay, he has also come to enjoy all this. He spoke nothing. And just about another 10 minutes before I was going to go up, I just prayed, Lord, please bless all these children. As I was praying it, the angel spoke to me. If you do these children's services just like everybody else, what's the difference between you being a prophet and the other churches? So I was shocked. Something is wrong. So I asked the angel, what do you mean? Did we do it wrong? So the angel asked me, what does the word say concerning children in the last days? So I, I quoted the scripture to him. What? Joel 2.28 so the angel asked me, so what does that word say? Your sons and your daughters shall see visions. So he said, 
shouldn't you be training the children towards that goal? I was so hit in my spirit when that angel spoke those words. I repented before God. So when I went up to the stage, many parents were there. And I confessed this to all the parents, asked for their forgiveness. Say, please forgive us. We have done a big mistake. I said, I have done. I won't blame my staff. Because I approved the program. I said, I have done a big mistake. And we will correct it right now. So I then called all the children, 300, 400 of them. I preached to them about Joel 2.28. I said, now we are going to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit for all the kids who are not filling the Holy Spirit. How many of you have not received the Holy Spirit? 300 hands went up. I said, okay. So if 300 hands went up, it means about a hundred of them are already filling the Holy Spirit. So I asked all the hundred who have already filled the Holy Spirit, they said, come and stand beside me. So they all came excitedly running. They stood on my left and they stood on my right. And I invited all the other 300, I said, you come and you stand in the altar area here. So I looked at all these hundreds, I told them, now you, you are all going to be my assistants today. They were all full of joy. You know, finally, they are going to be my assistants. What a great honor, they thought. Okay, so they said, what should we do? What should we do? Okay, now this is what you do. I'm going to pray one prayer. And then I want all you guys, go and lay hands on every one of these people and pray for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And don't let them go until you hear them speaking in tongues. That's a kiss. Yes, 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 uncle. Yes, grandpa. Yes. There was, you know, this bunch of kids are full of fire. More than you can imagine they have. They are just a small atomic bomb inside them. You know? So, I lifted up my hands and I prayed a prayer of blessing over the kids. Now I looked at them and said, now, go. They all went and grabbed their hands and they put their hands on this tree and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. They never let go until they all heard them speaking in tongues. And you know, all the 300 of them were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Prayed, not by an adult, but by the kids. By the kids. And the parents who watched all this, they were weeping. Tears were rolling down. In our vacation Bible schools, camps, we teach our children how to pray for the sick. I don't pray for them. I just make a guest appearance in the camp, you know, to give away the certificates. But, but they will all come running up to me, say, we are sick, I've got this problem, that problem. Say, okay, no problem, don't worry. All those who are sick, come to the front. They'll all excitedly come. And I'll ask all those who are well, I say, you come. You're going to be my assistant right now. Give me your hands. So I, I hold their hands. I pray a prayer of impartation of the gifts of healings to these children. I said, now you go, lay your hands upon them. Don't let them go until they all heal. Yes. You know, and they never let go until everyone is healed. Wow. This is how we teach them to pray for the nations, pray for the sick, to see visions, to hear the voice of God. The theme for this summer was how to hear the voice of God. So we taught these little ones how to be quiet, how to be still, how to hear the voice of God. And at the end of the five days, every one of their spiritual ears were opened. Amen. And they heard God speaking to them directly. Concerning their families. Concerning the nation. Concerning what is going to come to pass. Concerning what to pray. They ran the show. We just stand back, spectator. We should train our next generation for God's destiny upon them. Because their time is now coming. They're going to rise up. Even, you know, Psalms 8-2 says, the baby that drinks milk from the mother's breast is going to be anointed to cast out demons. Whoever has heard that in history in the past? No one, right? 
I, when I first revealed this in a, one of our meetings, and people had a hard time believing it. How can a little baby drinking milk from the mother's breast can cast out demons? They couldn't accept it. But I said, I saw an angel come and stand beside me. And the angel said, tell this to the people. This is what is going to happen next. The thoughtless and the babies. So I shared that. A month later, a mother came to me. She said, her two-year-old boy casted out demons from her servant girl. Two-year-old boy. He just stretched his hand and he just smiled. That was all. You know how little babies, they smile, they laugh in their baby language. He just pointed a finger and he just laughed. And the demon left. And the mother saw a dark demon shadow coming out of this servant girl. And she was shocked. And then she remembered what I prophesied. And the following month, she came to a meeting and testified before a crowd of 3,000 people what her little boy did. Which is a confirmation of the fulfillment of Psalms 8.2. See, those days are here. What are we doing? How are we going to train our little ones? Don't think. They know nothing. From our viewpoint, it seems they know nothing. But not from God's viewpoint. Amen. Not from God's viewpoint. Amen. He has a plan for these little babies. Yeah. He has a plan for thoughtless. Amen. He has a plan for your little children. And he has a plan for your youths. Amen. That is the next revolution that's going to take place in the church. So we should prepare the youths in our midst, in our churches. Prepare the children in our churches for the flood of God's spirit to come upon them. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up for a word of prayer. Tonight is going to be a special night like I shared with you last night. So please spend this afternoon times praying, waiting on God and seeking the face of God. And when we gather in the evening tonight, we'll pray for your needs. See, God knows what's in your need, heart, what you need. You don't have to walk up to me and tell me this is my problem. Can you please lay hands and pray? You don't need to do all that. God sees you, no? And he'll just come walking up to you and lay his hands upon you. Why do you want a mortal hand when you can have an eternal hand come and touch you? Right? Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your merciful kindness, for opening our hearts to making us hear all these things, Lord. We pray right now that your goodness and mercy will lead us into all truth, will show us all truth, and make all things plain and clear to us. Forgive us, Lord, for our shortcomings, for our rational reasonings, for our self-righteous, self-conceited attitudes. Today we come to you. Like the tax collector, not daring to lift up our face before you because for all the sins that we have done, Lord, we humbly bow our heads, we humbly bow our hearts and we ask you, Lord, remember us. Be gracious unto us. Be merciful unto us and strengthen us one more time. Strengthen us one more time, Lord, because you are a good God. Fulfill all your good pleasures in our lives. The things that have been spoken over our lives. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. 
the Holy Spirit shows me now there are many of you here who had received prophecies and promises from God concerning giftings concerning blessings but till now it's like the package has not been opened but the Lord said today today you will receive a touch from the Almighty today if you set your heart to believe today if you set your heart to seek his face today those promises will come to pass please don't condemn yourselves that you have missed God's call that you have lost his giftings that you have lost his grace enough of condemning yourselves the Lord your God gracious one standing before you is saying tonight you will be restored tonight you will be restored so prepare your hearts thank you wonderful Lord Jesus some pastors some ministers here may feel that your church or your ministry has sunken like a sunken ship under the sea the Lord says as Elisha commanded the axe head to come out come up from the bottom of the waters so will he cause the sunken ship to come up if you will put away your falsehood put away your backslidings and turn back to following the Lord your God with all your heart surely you will be restored that which even was taken away from you will be given back thank you wonderful Lord Jesus thank you wonderful Lord Jesus Glorious Jesus. So, one more time the word is coming unto me. Prepare yourselves this evening. 